Before we discuss the specifics of managing your forest, cropland, or wetland habitats, let's take a look at what habitat is and the practical effects it has on wildlife and to you, the landowner. When we think about wildlife habitat, food, cover and shelter, access to water, and space are habitat elements that come to mind. What do these mean for wildlife? Habitat provides all the elements that the, the species and, and, and maybe a diverse uh, community of species uh, need to run through their entire life history. They need areas where they can nest, they need areas where they can have their, their uh, young can be hatched and raised in, in, in protected from predators. They need areas where, where the young can forage and grow. They need areas where the adults can forage and bring food back to the, to the babies. And, and it's, it's that survival of their life history that, re, that, that is important for them to be able to perpetuate their species. And don't forget the element of space in habitat. Wildlife species all require different sized tracts of habitat called home range. Anytime a large block of habitat gets broken up into smaller parcels, you'll find that the potential for wildlife to flourish has been restricted because the home range of some species may have been limited. Let's consider a few examples of how this works for a couple of species we know. It may be difficult to imagine that in the early 1900s, white-tailed deer were almost extinct in many states because of a loss of woodland habitat. Deer need about a square mile of home range to browse on green leaves, flowers, acorns, and sometimes standing crops. During the day, they'll hide in thickets and woods and will move into the woody edges between dusk and dawn to browse. Deer are mobile, so they can travel long distances to reach food and cover in other unconnected habitats. If deer populations go unchecked, they will negatively impact plant communities and other wildlife species. Deer are known as habitat generalists because of their mobility and their ability to use many different habitats. The bobwhite quail, on the other hand, is a habitat specialist. Quail need between 40 and 200 acres of home range, but unlike deer, they can't migrate long distances to new habitats without the proper cover. When habitat is destroyed and fragmented, it's the habitat specialists like quail that suffer the most. To complete their life cycles, quail need a diverse ground vegetative cover of native grasses and forbs to survive. They'll nest in the bunch grasses like wire grass, and adult quail will feed on the vegetation. Quail chicks feed mostly on insects that thrive in this layer. But here's the interesting thing. There are many species that share the same habitat requirements as quail. So when you restore quail habitat, you'll also benefit the other species. These include the eastern towhee, the prairie warbler, and the brown thrasher in scrubby areas. And species like the eastern meadowlark, the field sparrow, and the loggerhead shrike in more open grassland habitats. Keep in mind that wildlife goes well beyond the popular game species like deer, turkey, and quail. In this video series, we'll talk about insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. And we'll also touch on aquatic wildlife that includes mollusks, crustaceans, and of course, fish. We've discussed the linkage between wildlife habitat and wildlife, but what are some of the underlying ideas that guide you when it comes to implementing practices on the ground? When, when we apply conservation practices, it's about changing the physical makeup of the land. It's about changing the herbaceous plant community structure. It's about bunch grasses that provide vertical structure as well as, as, well as travel areas at their base. Um, it's about shrubby vegetation that provides the next strata of physical features that, that, that provide vertical diversity in the landscape. It's about having areas where you have saplings and vines that provide that next level of strata. And then eventually going to a mature stand of whatever native uh, woody vegetation you would expect you would find. Remember also that physical structure includes features like rocky outcrops, rock piles, dead and down wood, snags, and brush piles. You want to make the best use of these valuable features as you consider physical structure for wildlife.
In our next segment, we'll discuss the ideas of succession and disturbance, and how we can use conservation practices to mimic nature to improve wildlife habitat.